Now we are in a 502. What is a 502? Well, it's an electric train and the code for it in British Rail operational days was a 502 different, which told people what type of train it was. But basically it's a, an electric train which was built at Derby in 1938 to 1940 in service from 1940 to approximately 1980 and ran between Liverpool and Southport and Liverpool and Ormskirk day in day out for 40 years. They've now been replaced by the current generation of 507 and 508 units which are in turn going to be replaced sometime in the next two or three years. Now the 502 was revolutionary at the time wasn't it? Yes, yeah. um, it was designed in Derby by London Midland Railway on the basis that they needed new units to replace some very American units which had been operating. There's a lot of Americanisms in here ranging from air operated doors, air braking, the manner in which the sides were welded to the framework, the way in which the exterior panels were not directly connected to the roof or to the, the, the floor. The whole manufacturing technique was new, the air operated doors were new and they all worked extremely well over the periods that they were in service. They've set a standard for what you see now in virtually every train in the country. How revolutionary was it as well in regards to the engineering? Because the engineering is very, very different, isn't it? The engineering is very different. Um, there's a tremendous amount of welding gone into the fabrication, which reduces the weight because you haven't got very hefty nuts and bolts. Everything is really unitised. All the seats are in units and can be lifted up and taken out. There's the frame here which just dismantles and it's in one piece. Take it out, bring a new one in. It was very, very advanced for its days where Historically, you had many carpenters standing and working together, actually building something in situ. A lot of these parts were built outside the unit and then installed into the unit. Effectively, like moving into a house. You move some tables in, some chairs in. They moved seating and various other things in and just bolted them into place. Now there's something very very different about this as well, it looks more like an aircraft once you get the shell off. Yes, yes, there's a, the interior um, construction is very very sophisticated. Um, yes, there are some wooden pieces that come across, but most of it is steelwork. The exterior of the roof and the interior lining was a gap of about so much and that allowed passage of air which kept damp out perhaps not so good for insulation but we're talking about designs in the 1930s and operating up to the 1970s but they were very very well thought out. The heating was very different as well to most of the trains of that era well, most of the trains of that era were, were steam heated with pipes that came through radiators which were under the floors and under the seats. On these units, there were electric heaters under the seats, but they were run on quite high amperage and quite high voltage. Yes, they generated a lot of heat, but they're also full of asbestos. Uh, we won't be replacing those. We'll come up with a new um, operational um, heating system, although we will be putting back the heating units under the seats. It's only a question of just screwing them back into the floor where they came from. Does the uh, fact that asbestos was used in it cause any added difficulty for maintaining and updating the actual project? There's no asbestos in this at all. It's all gone. It all went years and years ago. It was taken out when they were in operational days. 
And when we were given the unit by National Railway Museum in 2011, there was no asbestos at all. The heating units, which are about so big and so thick, we've just taken them off the floor by unscrewing them. We've disconnected the wiring. What's inside stays inside. Is there anything unusual that you are surprised at finding that you wouldn't have actually thought was actually in here? Oh, um, yes, and the, the way the, win the windows are put together. These are the side windows, the curved windows that go up there. They're all brass. And you can see all the bolting systems, nuts and bolt systems to hold them in place with brass nuts and bolts. That was something we weren't quite expecting. They're also very heavy. That might be what you see on this view. But what you don't see on the inside are hardwood window surrounds, the edges. There's a ledge there where the glass was inserted into and the wooden frame went all the way round. Very, very nice. Um, didn't help with um, leakage of water through from the outside and condensation on the inside. But, uh, we will be solving that problem in modern manner when these windows go back in so there won't be the same damp and condensation. Um, we're not strictly following everything must be absolute heritage, but uh, they used hardwoods in the 1930s, we're using hardwoods now. Uh, we'll use modern um, sealants for the, for the glass, which will make water penetration um, very much more difficult. Similar um, process to the way your car windscreens in. Is there anything that you're finding difficult about it, like the windows? Because you mentioned uh, uh, just off camera mm. that you're having great difficulties with some parts. Yes, some of these small um, nuts and bolts. Um, let's go into the um, brass window frame. This is the um, brass bolt. We can get these in mild steel and stainless steel these days. But the thing we're having difficulty in sourcing is the nut, which is a very significant shape. The head on it is recessed into the framework. And there's a screw slot across the top so that they can be tightened from the inside instead of having to go outside. Whereas normally you would tighten with the screwdriver at that end. Now, um, these were v interesting. Um, a lot of them come out um, very easily and are reusable. All right, clean them up, but they're very, very reusable because they don't rot. But we've lost a lot that have suffered over the years and we need to, to replace them. That's one of the stumbling blocks uh, we, we, we have at the moment. But we, we generally overcome all the little issues that we find. It's a question of um, who do we know who can do this? Who can help us to source things? And we can overcome things. Is there anything you are after at the moment, apart from the nuts? Is there any other items? Not um, in any great detail at the moment, because these are the ones that are holding up, finishing off this um, vestibule and compartment area that we're in. Uh, as you can see, we've got parts of the window frames in, but until we've got sufficient supplies of these, we can't complete that. We can't put the glass back in, and until we've done that, um, we can't really outfit the rest of the seating, some of which you can see around. Um, we're at the stage where in a week or a fortnight we could have this fully habitable without any issues at all. We've got all the seating things. Yes, we need to um, source um, screws and nuts and bolts. 
these are the ones that are currently causing the um, small problem. Uh, in the in the future, we might find that we might need some problem, might have some problems with some of the old electrical wiring that went in on the control basis. We'll be, that will all be replaced with brand new, um, modern equivalent. But it's a question of making sure that we get the right wires onto the right terminals and what have you. But that's something we will deal with when we get there. We're a year off being in that position. Now, you have an issue about actually running the train as well, don't you? Because of its size. Well, the, the train is, is quite wide. Um, it would operate um, adequately on heritage railways. In terms of operating on the um, main line, we think Network Rail might have um, some issues with the age of the train, its braking capacity, not m meeting modern standards. We don't really have any intention of trying to renovate the unit to full mainline operational status. Not only would that take forever, but we're talking about multi-millions of, of pounds. And we see this as um, a very, very useful op uh, unit to operate on a heritage railway. Very comfortable, very spacious. Um, diesel engine to provide power. Why power? Well, where this unit is air braked and the doors are air operated. That was um, very, very rare in the 1930s and 1940s. With the heritage diesel, you can take off an air supply through the connections that already exist and that can provide the power for the for the braking. We can also take electric power off a diesel unit which will provide all we need for the internal electrics, for the, the lighting, the heating, for the PA system, for the emergency lighting and for, for all the other um, controls that w will be necessary like and the lights for the interlocking doors. Now, they never had those in the past. But if we're going to operate with carrying passengers, whoever is guarding the train and the driver need to be assured that all the doors are properly locked before the train sets off. Now you've got another interesting issue as well, which is with the way it operates, uh, which is about the guards, isn't it? Well, not really. Um, we would want to run with a conventional guarding system, full stop. Well, we, we're not seeing it as um, being of the um, modern era where, where everything is so controlled. We have to bear in mind that this is a heritage unit to be operated in heritage circumstances. There won't be a problem with the with the guarding. Is there anything uh, that can be done to support you at the moment, fund-wise? Well, the biggest thing that we've got at the moment to support ourselves fund-wise is we've organised a railway tour by bus from Southport to Liverpool and then back to, to Ormskirk and then back here to Bersco on the 2nd of April. This is looking at some of the route that these trains used up to the 1980s and it's also looking at the old exchange station which closed 40 years ago this year which will be replaced by the Loop and the Link Underground in, in Liverpool. We'll be looking at some of the artefacts there, some of the historic points um, our vehicle is audio equipped so that along most of the way there will be an audio commentary of some sort. We're looking to take people then from over in Liverpool to the National Museums on Merseyside. We'll have access to the Liverpool Overhead Railway Coach. It's 60 years at the beginning of this year that the Liverpool Overhead Railway closed and it was demolished. Um, not many people re remember that but there's lots of photographs and images. 
We'll be looking at some of the industrial archaeology for that as we come out of Liverpool. And then we'll be um, going across over towards Aintree. Well, we'll be sitting at entry Station for a while, opposite the Grand National course, one week before the Grand National takes place. Now these units ran intensive services for um, horse racing events at entry, but for the Grand National, Liverpool Overhead Railway ran across through into entry Station, so that there's a connection between the two, a very broad um, connection. Now we'll be coming up here to um, Persco. Um, our friends at Merseyside Transport Trust are opening up parts of the um, facilities here, moving some of the buses out, not just for people to see but providing access. Um, after that we'll be returning to Southport. Now because we're a voluntary body we're not proposing to charge a fare. We're going to take a donation. Take a donation along on the way back. Now that acts as a useful fundraiser for us as well as providing a very, very interesting day out for people. Uh, even if it rains, bearing in mind that we're stopping in various locations, we've got a double-decker bus with plenty of visibility, we're not going to be inconvenienced by the weather. Uh, this is taking place on Sunday the 2nd of April. Um, other than that, um, we do manage to get sponsorship from our own members and, and supporters in terms of buying the steel work that we need for the sides of the coach. We don't need to replace the roof, we don't need to replace the framework, the structure of underneath where I'm standing. We put st new steel work into the floor to support the floor and the marine ply that uh, we're standing on is at the stage where we could just put the final linoleum coat on it and it would be ready for the seats to go in. Um, we're generously supported by our friends and members and we're always interested in taking into our organisation more friends and members. The more people who are interested in the work we're doing are very welcome to come along and, and join us on probably Tuesdays and Saturdays when we're working on the unit here in Bersco. Thank you for your time. Mm. Have a fantastic time restoring this mm. and even more fun when you actually get it out. Mm. Uh, we look forward to seeing it sometime on the rail lines. Well, we're hoping that that will be in the not too distant future. Thank you very much, Patrick.